Hello everyone, it's Friday, June 30th. I'm David Song, here with my friends and colleagues, Mr. Michael Brutros, as well as Mr. Christopher Vecchio. How's it going, guys? Good morning, happy Friday, everyone. Good morning, David. So, you know, I think there's gonna be a lot of talk about today. Um, you know, personally, I just wanna dig into what's your thoughts after we've gotten some meaningful commentary, some meaningful price action, if you will, I think across um, financial markets, you know, I, I think it's be, it goes beyond the FX market. But before we start, guys, just some house cleaning stuff. So, you know, for everyone that's joined this morning, um, you're all signed up for a free IG demo. So certainly feel free to check that out at your own leisure. And don't forget, guys, I think, you know, one of the overall themes we need to watch today is, you know, what's really materializing as we're wrapping up the month, wrapping up the quarter, and as we head into the second half of the year. So, you know, with that, let's start things off here. And, you know, I'll just bring up a chart here of the dollar index. Uh, certainly some interesting moves that's been going on and you know even if you bring up the DXY here you know we're making fresh 2017 lows and just to backtrack guys remember what happened this month right we got the Fed rate hike we've got a new or, or more detailed X strategy but a lot of you know I think confusion going on so you know let me toss it off to you Chris uh, what's your sort of thoughts and what are you watching um, some themes trade setups if you will as we're going into uh, then the quarter ahead well, there are two aspects to uh, policy that are impacting the dollar right now, one monetary, one fiscal. On the monetary side of things, uh, the Fed did come out and raise rates, and while they were hawkish relative to market expectations in their guidance, I don't think the market actually believes the Fed's going to be able to raise rates um, a third time this year. Right now, mm -hmm. Fed funds futures are pricing in March 2018 as the most likely period for the next Fed rate hike. The odds of a December 2017 rate hike are only 48.8%. Uh, you know, when I think about what's going on in Treasury yields, I'm more in line with the idea that it's Draghi this week who's been influencing the bump up in yields globally mm -hmm. rather than anything Yellen has said or done. Um, I also think that Mark Carney signaling that the BOE is going to end its QE program also gives an incentive for rates to rise. So on the dollar side of things, mm -hmm. if the market and the Fed are at this you know impasse right now where the Fed saying one thing, the market believes something else. To me, that also is not only the recent source of weakness for the dollar, but it's also the potential future source of strength. If, for some reason, if data turns the corner mm -hmm. uh, and we go into the second half of the year because expectations are so depressed, then that's a situation in which the dollar could, you know, ride rising interest rate expectations higher. That's what, let's I, was say. Ask, that's what I was about to ask you, Chris. Yeah. Is the risk to the upside on a readjustment for for more interest rate hikes, or is the risk to the downside? I from think here. The, I, from here, it really depends on what the market believes. The Fed can say whatever they want to say. The, it's the market's belief that there won't be a rate hike this year, which has pushed the dollar lower. So if the market changes its mind, the Fed could say, we're only going to do one rate hike this year. We're not going to do balance sheet normalization. If the market has to adjust to that point of view, even though it would be backing off from what the Fed's previously said, it's still more, it's still more aggressive and hawkish than what's currently mm -hmm. priced in. Hmm. So, you know, I, I personally think that we're getting closer to a floor in the dollar. Not that we're here just yet, but I think we're getting closer to the floor in the dollar than most people realize. I also think that there could be a washout in the greenback if healthcare fails, which is the other side of policy for the dollar mm -hmm. right now. Um, you know, just from a purely uh, procedural point of view, the way you can only get to tax reform uh, uh, with, with this fiscal reform plan for the Trump administration is if you unlock those tax savings by going through health care reform. It's through the reconciliation process. So if health care reform fails, then all of a sudden tax reform likelihood goes lower, and then infrastructure spending you can totally forget about. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen whatsoever. And it seems like, you know, for now, maybe the more positive surprises have been coming out of Europe, you know, and, you know. Absolutely. And, and before we further on this discussion, Mike, you know, you're looking at some interesting sort of uh, trend line and uh, some key levels, I think, that are coming up for the dollar index. So um, what's your sort of thoughts with all that's going on right now, and especially in terms of, you know, the, the weakness that we're seeing in the greenback? Sure. So it's been an interesting month uh, for those of you who've been with me for, uh, for for this break here. First of all, good hello to everyone in here in the room. Good to see you guys. Feel free at any point throughout the session to throw any questions or trade setups you guys want to review. I'll be more than happy to take a look for you. But um, yeah, so for the index, I mean, a monthly opening range break way, way late in the month right here on the uh, on the 6th, essentially, is when we start to really, or the 27th rather, of June is when we really start to break down. Looking at this slope, I mean, 
at the end of the day, you still have some, some room to the downside, I think, before this thing really pukes out. You are getting some divergence in momentum as you hold 30 here, so you could get a little bit of a rebound, but the, essentially the main level that we're looking at at this point, you have some two uh, just near-term targets right around the 95 handle, but this is the big confluence region. Um, this slope we've been following is just a basic parallel off the lows, was a break acceleration. We saw it tag perfect support back here last year and it converges on the 7, 8, uh, 6, as well as some swing lows. So that still leaves room for another, you know, what, 150-point drop, 100-point drop down to 94.50. Um, but I love the mindset of what uh, uh, Chris just said. You know, it could be a sort of a last sort of puke out as you get into the first quarter, one last flush to the downside. But if we do see that turn in expectations or, or people start to fully price in this kick out in interest rate expectations, that's where I'm looking for a little bit more of a concerted low. Now, as far as like what resistance would be, it's right back at that key level we targeted earlier in the month, 96.46. The breach that would put us bullish or bearish in validation, I still have here. Previous low day close for the year comes in on the 14th. It's also the monthly open, and it also converges on a nice parallel here for the current slope we've been following. That's like 96.96, basically the 97 handle. So the levels are really well mapped out. And I think on the dollar crosses, you can also see this type of setup materialize. But um, for the index as it stands, obviously it's going to be sort of an inverse euro dollar picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has us coming into near-term resistance too. It's the basic trend line resistance off that swing high from late 2015. You can see we're really close to approaching that at this point as well. And yeah, we've taken out a lot of targets for the euro just in the matter of days. And you know, we'll mm -hmm. see if this will continue. And that's where I've, you know, during my per my webinars throughout the week, and that's what I think, you know, I'm certainly trying to figure out at the moment is we've got a lot out of the Federal Reserve, but not only out of Federal Reserve, but, you know, the ECB, we've gotten their new forecast. And you know, there was a stark difference. And the biggest thing I would note is ECB cut their inflation forecast through 2019, largely because of temporary factors or transitory factors, right? They reduced their oil forecast, also bump up their euro, euro dollar forecast, right? And, you know, Chris and I were talking about this throughout the week, and, you know, with this appreciation in the euro, will that continue to be the story, right? With, you know, the ECB continue to revise their forecast, but the Fed, you know, are they a little bit more upbeat? You know, they continue to forecast 2.0 inflation next year, all the way into 2019, and, you know, we've only saw a minor revision, you know, with the inflation forecast this year, but, you know, Chris, we've got some interesting comments from the ECB this week, but what was your overall take and, you know, what's your sort of, you know, sort of, I guess, looking in hindsight now, now that we've seen how, you know, the euro is acting, given some of the commentary, what's your expectations going forward? Yeah, I still think the euro can run uh, a little bit to the upside. We saw the German CPI beat yesterday. We saw that uh, the core inflation figure beat today. Uh, and overall, inflation was a little bit higher than what was anticipated, although the headline figure was still lower than it was last month. Um, you know, I, I think right now for the euro, it's important to start to recognize that we're starting to get a little bit heady up here, uh, where I think that we could continue our rally through 114 and maybe even head up as high as those swing highs we had about this time last year, uh, pre-Brexit vote. Um, you know, mm -hmm. roughly at the end of May, uh, and and uh, to me that would be you know 116 or so. But once you get up towards 116, all of a sudden you're in territory where uh, it, the euro is really going to start to weigh on the inflation picture for mm -hmm. uh, the ECB. The ECB currently forecasts the euro at I believe 109 yep. uh, going forward, and so once you get up to 116 or so, you're talking about something that's you know seven percent give or take away. And uh, th that's going to be a dramatic uh, impact on the inflation outlook. And if the ECB has to then in turn lower their inflation outlook, then that means implicitly they're going to keep their foot on the accommodative um, pedal more. But uh, with that said, Mario Draghi this week basically has said that the you know, effects for oil right now are transitory and uh, inflation is going to you know, stabilize once again. Um, I think there's some credence to that. We see here that right now if you look at what's been going on with inflation swaps in the Eurozone, they're up to 1.598% today. Um, just back on June 21st, they were down at 1.498%, which was a six-month low. Crude oil is now down 6.4% year-over-year, and from this time last year until about August, uh, crude oil was in a little bit of a drop there. It actually traded below $40 per barrel uh, last uh last August. So, you know, we're now going into a period where now oil prices are going to start to even out a little bit. Um, that, in effect, should mean that once we get to the August data period, 
the the impact of energy prices on inflation should have gone from say negative to back to neutral and in that case inflation may stabilize that to me has opened up the door for a ECB move in September I think the markets could start to price that in a little bit and then you get this mix of factors all of a sudden coalescing together here you know the Fed if the data stays bad in the near term, um, the Fed looks like they're wrong and the markets continue to price out a rate hike. You have health care reform looking like it may not pass through the Senate, which would be disappointing for the dollar. On the euro side of things, you have the ECB just starting to wade into the water to up expectations for a September move. Euro dollar could push higher up towards 116 to me, and then at that level, I think you know, that'd be a pretty interesting point to look at a sell. And uh, and again, DX, as Boucher's pointed out earlier, mm -hmm. this is a real direct implication for DXY because Euro is 57.6% of the dollar index. Mm -hmm. And again, guys, you know, I'm just sharing the ECB forecast table here. I'll actually throw this out in the chat box, guys, if you want to look at it, look over it at your own leisure. But again, you know, when you look at some of these assumptions brought up to the brought up by the ECB, and again, this is just from early this month, right, at the rate decision, you know, are these expectations a little tamed? Do they have to continue to adjust these, um, again, expectations for the euro dollar exchange rate, oil price, right? And as a result, you know, will they be or will they be some constraints on that? And, you know, with that said, I think the one argument I want to take here, guys, and I just want to get your response on this is, yes, euro does look a little bit exhausted up here, this and that, but is this a, a trend that, you know, can we fight it for now? You know, I think we could be at a risk for a pullback here. And, you know, I know Mr. Boutros was talking about a lot of these highs and some of these levels, look, the uh, open day close levels that we need to watch here and really the behavior that we're seeing. But, you know, I think this is more than just the euro story, right? We looked at the dollar index, but, you know, let me just shift our focus now to the dollar cad where we've seen some meaningful developments here. And, you know, I want to take your sort of approach on, you know, what's happening here. Is this the real deal? Are we really seeing a change of behavior and will this continue in the second half of the year? Was that for me, David? Yeah, I mean, feel free, any of you guys. Um, I think we just, we all been talking <laughs> about dollar cat so much and I know, you know, Mike, you, you actually threw out that special report, but now that we're cracking yeah. the 2017 lows, you know, do, do you think we still have some more room to the downside? So dollar cat was a great play this week. Um, I hope you guys can see my screen at this point. Here's what we've been following. You know, the major, major break was 3140. That completed 100% extension off the highs. It validated a break of a trend line support extending off the June lows. I mean, this was the real key target. Um, the report you're talking about, David, from earlier in the week was uh, regarding this key zone of resistance. And that's really what turned the table for us. Um, from a technical standpoint, you had the 200-day moving average, you had slope resistance. Uh, some former swing lows and close highs. So the reversal off that region was really well, um, it was well received. And then this break is really what validated it. So at this point, we've taken out the 2017 low day close. We've closed below that. That's from earlier in the year back here in the last day of January trade. And we're now testing the 2017 low. It's the same trade that we're looking at with the euro, right? In that, and the dollar index for that matter, in that we could be reaching near term exhaustion certainly not a level of which you want to start shorting or chasing the downside. So David, I'm with you now we could get a near term recovery and it's just on account of we're closing out the month uh, quarter, opening up a new, uh, a new uh, a quarter here, a new month mm -hmm. heading into Monday. You could see some recovery, but the mm -hmm. focus still remains lower. Yeah, I yeah. think you can stretch into that 128.90 level mm -hmm. easy. The implications for this break um, are pretty big. So I do, I do expect some further downside pressure. Now from the fundy side, I throw mm -hmm. it back to you. What can we get from Canada that would really further fuel it? You know, one other thing I just want to take before I pass the screen over is a segue at the oil market, which also obviously people are going to be closely watching. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, that is approaching a near-term resistance level as well. So this is the formation we've been following off the highs of the year. Mm -hmm. You can see the median line coming right in here and embedded formation off of the near-term highs also gets you the upper parallel there with a basic 38.2. So you're approaching near-term resistance as we speak, I think, um, maybe a little bit higher into 45.83 for crude prices before you start to really get concerned of any major resistance. But you can envision a scenario basically where crude probes a little higher, dollar cad probes, probes a little lower, then you get that little bit of recovery and that will be an opportunity to get back, I think, uh, on the short side for dollar cad. Yeah, I mean, I mean dollar, cards, dollar cards had a big move in part because interest rate expectations for the Bank of Canada have just yes. kind of gone wild the last few weeks. Uh, I think that know, was just a few surprise, weeks. right? 
Yeah, there was less than a one in three chance of mm -hmm. a BOC rate hike just, you know, three weeks ago. And now there's over a 50% chance of a BOC rate hike next month. So hey, what is that I'm, based on? What is that shift based on? You know, I couldn't tell you that it was based on oil because oil's fared so poorly. I think it's just generally improving fundamentals of the Canadian economy and expectations given where things stand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're kind of looking in the direction of where things are going. And they realize also now that other countries are starting to, you know, raise interest rates, um, they, they don't want to be on the short end of, of the stick and, and be the last one to get off the zero bound. Otherwise, that invites a whole plethora of inflation potentially down the line as people look to borrow cheaply in that, that currency and uh, it sends capital into the country. Very good point. You know, and, and we'll see, and I think that that might be the sort of tone that we're getting, right? That this change in language, not only from the ECB Bank of England, maybe the Bank of Canada, you know, will this be a fresh theme we need to watch? And, you know, maybe some of these trends, longer term trends that we've been watching, are they really going to start to deteriorate? Are we on a new course? And I think that's where the RBA next week could be very interesting, and I know, you know, we'll have to keep a close eye on the Aussie here as it's holding up fairly nicely, to say the least. I think, you know, so, so we'll take some questions actually before we move on, and you know, maybe we can sort of segue RBA into the discussion. But Pete before was asking about Euro Aussie, um, looks as though Pete, um, let's see here, first target one of forty nine sixty six. So Pete continues like okay, upside. So I like it. Go ahead, Mike. So Pete. Yeah, I was going to say, so um, Pete, I see your question there and those targets that you're looking for for 149.66. Before I jump into Euro Oz, I just want to highlight um, where Aussie is coming into resistance. And I just want to kind of bring this to your attention. Basic, basic trend line resistance just off the 2016 highs, nothing fancy here. Uh, you tagged it twice in that year. You probed it earlier this year. It was like literally to the pip. That's exactly where we just peaked today. So I would kind of get concerned of trying to get aggressive on an Aussie long position from here into the close of the month, uh, week, quarter, all that good stuff, right? Uh, that would be my only concern with taking sort, sort of a, a long stance uh, on the Aussie from here. So yeah, you could see some weakness for you, Pete, on the long side of Euro Oz. Um, this is what it would look like. You would kind of want to see this thing pull back a little bit. Here's Euro Oz. And... You made a break back below the 2016 open, you made a break back below this median line here. So I think you still could get some further downside just into the US open, but largely speaking on Euro Oz, it's a pretty big, um, it's a pretty big move. This is the daily chart, okay? Um, I'd be concerned a little bit about trying to get aggressive from here. I would personally, or personally on this one, I'm looking for a move back into the median line. I think this is so sort of your ideal entry for a long position. Um, from here, I'm not sure where your stop is on that one, 148.16. Okay, let me drill down a little bit deeper for you on this. So you're basically playing it against the low here. So you have that median line a little bit lower, Pete. I'd be watching that. Um, I still think you can get a little bit of a drawback. Again, not a trade recommendation from IG or daily effects, but um, I'd be cautious. Keep in mind, again, the time, tra the time in which you're trading. Uh, leaves us vulnerable for intraday positions. So if you're going to play it that tight, uh, just make sure that you have your stops well and play on this one. But as far as the Aussie is concerned, uh, guys, you, you tell me. I mean, the RBA is on tap next week. Is there anything that could possibly really upset this massive stretch? I mean, I feel like this is kind of playing catch up with Kiwi, um, which has just been ripping face. But, you know, from a price standpoint of where we are right now, where does it leave us as far as the risk is concerned heading into the RBA next week? I mean, personally, from my end, I think we're just going to get more of the same, you know. Um, yeah, data has been fairly good, but, you know, there's a little bit of a different situation in Australia and New Zealand where they, you know, facing this sort of housing crisis, if you will. I don't want to say it's a bubble, but, you know, they've been trying to tame what's been going on, especially in terms of lending and, you know, household indebtedness, especially with both of these regions. So they've been really trying to tackle that, and even with the RBNs, uh, RBNZs, uh, their stance, right? They're noting that that's probably one of the biggest domestic risks for them is what's happening in the housing market. So, you know, unlike what we're seeing, you know, with the ECB, Bank of Canada, where a lot of these economies are, you know, ha are went through these transitions, it looks as though they're coming out on the you know, sort of better end of the central bank expectation. So with that, you know, I think that's going to be a, a theme to watch where, again, these European block currencies, you know, will they continue to outperform? But, you know, in terms of Australia, New Zealand, uh, especially with Australia, again, we'll see what's going to happen with their credit rating. 
uh, especially where all those financial uh, financial institutions being downgraded by S&P. You know, I'm still a little bit cautious here. And, you know, that's the one thing I would just bring to mind is Aussie really hasn't moved over the last year, has it? You know, it, we're still stuck in that 2016 range where, you know, my broader outlook is that's what I'm looking at too, Mike, is what's going to be the catalyst, right? We've got the Fed rate hikes. We've got this, you know, detailed exit strategy now for the balance sheet. But why aren't we getting a more, you know, lasting longer term sort of view here where we're a perfect example there of that weekly chart, um, but we're really sort of stuck. You know, I think time and time over, this, yeah. This pretty much says it all. Mm -hmm. You know, this pretty much says it all. It's decision time. You know what I mean? So uh, if we finally do make an outsized break on this weekly chart, really suggests where we are, the, you know, possibility for a larger scale recovery here in, in Aussie is pretty clear. I mean, this is a trend line that we've tested four times. Uh, on a weekly basis, like I said, even the stretches have been very, very clean. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the momentum signature, we've continued to hold below 60 since last year's peak. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if you were talking earlier about a change in behavior and what kind of things we look at in a technical standpoint, if we were to close a weekly candle above 60 momentum, that's like your classic shift yeah. that you want to sort of start to look higher, especially because you got that last rebound on both of those occasions ahead of 40. So from a momentum profile standpoint, from a price action standpoint, this is pretty big. The resistance that we're testing right now um, is a pretty big region. Yeah, and that's where I think, you know, hopefully we'll get some clarity following the RBA. And, you know, that that's where I think, you know, personally, I think there could be some room for disappointment. You know, now with, you know, the language out of the ECB, BOC, maybe that's what markets are looking for from, you know, Governor Philip Lowe and company next week. But, you know, if we do get more of the same, will there be some sort of disappointment? And will we see Aussie coming off? And will this, you know, consolidation, if you will, from last year, will that persist? But Chris, any, any thoughts on RBA next week? Well, I mean, if it's more of the same from the RBA, didn't you think their last set of minutes were fairly upbeat despite the Q1 data weakness or Q1 GDP weakness? It has Real been, Real GDP yes. decline? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that right now, if you take a look at what's going on with the Australian dollar versus what's going on with, say, the Aussie uh, bond yield, uh, U.S. bond yield swap spread, um, the Australian dollar currency is a lot stronger than what yields would imply, so I think it's people that are front-running an expectation that the RBA is going to shift to a gradually more hawkish stance over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the data has been, employment data has been a little bit better out of Australia. Um, some reports here and there are popping up to the upside. So uh, the RBA seems to have this point of view that it wants to raise rates. And I think ultimately uh, it, it, it will start to put that into its policy a little bit more. That said, I can't really get behind a large you know, scale Aussie recovery right now because of the influence of emerging markets on the currency, mm -hmm, particularly mm -hmm. China. Um, there's a lot of concern on what's going on with their credit market right now. A lot of people are starting to speak up about it again. Mm -hmm. and so I, I'm not so, so Chris, inclined to take a bet on that. You're of the mindset that we're going to, you know, largely hold within this pattern still right now. Yeah, I mean, I don't really see foresee price going beyond, you know, 79 at present uh -huh. time with the highs that we had in early 2016. Sure. You know, it's going to be interesting to watch how some of these themes are going to pan out. And, you know, Bernard here is asking about the DAX. And, you know, the one thing I'll, I'll mention about the DAX here, Bernard, is uh, very interesting price action, I think, or reaction. Let me say it that way to the comments from um, Drahi, right? Um, doesn't look as though DAX like the upbeat, less dovish comments from Drahi. And, in fact, you know, we're seeing this sort of pullback, right? And that's the way I want to say it because... And, and just looking at Mr. Butcher's charts here, a lot of bullish formation still remains, right? And I think we've come to this period time and time over again where we get these correctional phases and, you know, markets start jumping, you know, is it different this time around, you know, is this the real deal where we're going to unravel, you know, the, the, the rally that we've seen in a lot of these benchmark equity indices. But personally, Pete, I don't think we're there yet, right? Uh, again, nice pullback, maybe a correction here, you know, that's going on. But you know what, let me just take over the screen real quickly because there are some things I want to share before before we move on. And, you know, this is the theme that I want to just sort of bring up um, in light of the things that's happened this week, right? So, yeah, I'll bring up my DAX chart real quickly for you. But I also want to bring up what's happening with sentiment. And I sort of hinted at this um, during my webinar, the data coverage. So, you know, meaningful decline that we're getting, you know, going into the end of the month. So is there a risk that we can continue? For sure. You know, I think we could get a bigger correction um, as we're largely failing to retain some of these longer term bullish formations on the RSI. So getting a little bit concerned. And again, is this the start of it as the ECB is changing its tone. So we'll need a little bit more confirmation on the fundamental side, 
right? Greater push that they will reduce, right, uh, the asset purchase program. And remember, guys, they only have four more meetings left over the course of the year. So if they're going to move, they have to move relatively soon to meet that December deadline. But here's the biggest thing I just want to point out before we move on. And I just want to show you guys where we are as we're heading or wrapping up the month, wrapping up the quarter. But I'm seeing a lot of extreme sentiment, right, especially in the retail sector. Uh, let me just start off with the euro dollar, right? 20.4% of traders are long the euro dollar, right? Um, again, 20.4% of traders are long the euro dollar. So a heavy net short position here for euro dollar, right? And you can see it on the screen. It's diverging, right? So even though euro is sitting at fresh 2017 highs, right? Markets are probably the most bearish since at least this chart goes back to the beginning of the year. Yeah, it's, we're seeing retail sentiment the most bearish all year long, right? This gets me concerned, right? And if you look at the, the shift that we're seeing from last week, longs are down 28%. So was there some profit taking on the way up for those that caught the rally and are seeing this you know, mentality that, hey, maybe the euros moved too far, so it's a good sell up here. Maybe just, again, just psych um, you know, market psychology coming in rather than you know, doing proper analysis, right? And this is what gets me concerned. Let's go to you know, cable. 32.9% of traders are long, right? So just to get to the theme, there's this sort of heavy long dollar positioning in retail, which gets me concerned, right? Uh, where does that pain lie that maybe these retail traders that are long the green bag, maybe they'll get washed out? Uh, we'll cover dollar yen is not too at a, too much of an extreme rate. 58.9% um, of traders are not long, right? So it's sort of balanced there, which is quite interesting that dollar yen is most balanced. But you know, keep in mind, I would argue maybe the you know two maybe most popular pairs, euro and pound. You know, we're seeing the skew right, of net long dollar here versus these currency pairs, which I'm not sure if it really makes too much sense, right? So market's a little bit skewed, I think. Uh, we'll see if this will continue over the days ahead, but. You know, with that said, and back to your question, Bernard, is this just a big unwind right, of what's happened as of late? Have markets enjoyed this rally? And now that we're getting this shift in tone, especially from the ECB, right, are markets scaling back on this as, again, looks as though maybe the ECB and maybe we will face a taper tantrum in Europe right, over the remainder of the year. So a theme that, you know, I'll continue to watch. But uh, for now, you know, let's take it back to some of the um, other pairs or other securities that I'm watching, right? In light of this, Nikkei 225, which I like watching for the yen pairs. Whoops. Right. Um, keep typing in wrong. But even with the Nikkei uh, holding up fairly nicely, right? And this was sort of seen as the laggard of the year. That's the approach that I took. But it's holding up fairly nicely. I think a lot of these bullish conditions remain. So until we break down, right, I'll stay on course for a move higher. Um, any thoughts from you guys in terms of you know, watching anything on the equity space? Yeah, the S&P chart. The mm -hmm. S&P daily chart looks wicked. I don't know if you guys have been looking at that. Yes. Um, David, I mean, all you, all you need with this thing is slope, straight mm -hmm. up. It's pretty clean. Um, I think from here, it's a little tricky. I kind of liked where we had initially turned. Um, David, if I could just grab the screen from you again. Uh, here's, whoops. See a quick blip on the radar, guys. Uh, here's you know, what we've been uh, sharing with our subscribers here, this is basically a, you know, very simple pitchfork. We've been working off the 2015 lows and 2016 lows. All of these red lines are the same slope, same parallel, peak or trough rather, caught the trough, an extension just off the late December low, basically caught uh, most of the plays that we've been seeing here. Even the break and acceleration tested this as a resistance for a day before recovering. And you can see the, the 50 line again, basically governing the highs this week. The pullback coming into the weekly, into the monthly open, former swing highs. So I like the formation and the pattern we're trading within. The only problem is that this thing never even made a, a monthly opening range break, guys. We're essentially slightly higher for mm -hmm. the month. We mm -hmm. haven't done jack. So for me, the real, you know, the emphasis on this is either a move sub 124.07, which would certainly risk a larger decline down towards the 100-day moving average, maybe even towards a lower parallel. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everyone will be you know, screaming to high L if that starts to break. Um, but it's still in a constructive pattern. I don't really think there's much to get overly bearish yet. You're getting divergence and momentum. You're getting the profile starting to turn over. So yeah, mm -hmm. it definitely risks some sort of corrective pullback. But until you start to break those near-term supports, those near-term lows, it's very hard to kind of get bearish you know, from these levels still. And you know what, let's let's segue into Pete's question, and I guess we'll wrap up with, you know, sort of the trade setups we'll look for next week. And Pete was oh, actually... Oh, yeah, I see yeah, that. Yeah. 
So Pete, uh, good to see you in the room here. Yeah, he was saying, hey Mike, I'm looking at Aussie Yen towards 88 with the strong Aussie play. I think Euro is stronger. Fresh yearly highs could be in order with further Aussie strength and continued Yen weakness. Have to watch risk trends for sure. Mm -hmm. So for Aussie Yen, interesting you bring that up, Pete. We've also been following this one very closely. I'm going to take you back to the weekly chart. For those of you who've been with Daily FX for a while, uh, I literally haven't changed this. This is the uh, yearly forecast from last year uh, heading into December. Uh, this was my trade of the year. I was looking to stay constructive above 81.80, looking for a topside break for these targets. Now, obviously, in time, it took us a little bit longer. Uh, we did test those levels, and here's the rebound. Before you look at 88, Pete, I still have to highlight this 87.65, 87.55 region. It's really rock solid at this point. Uh, not only is the 50% retracement of the entire decline off that 2014 highs, but you know it's also the 2016 open. It was the stretch high that you made in December and continues to be major resistance. So um, ahead of the 88 target, I would be looking at this. If this breaks out, I think 88 is super conservative, man. I think you can get it up into 90.64. You know, I've moved these targets over with slope. That gives us you know, deep, deep into the third quarter. Um, and you know, broadly speaking, I think on this one, from this level right here, you're going to have to require yen weakness, right? Because as I said earlier, and as we were noting, Aussie's at pretty much a terminal resistance level for the broader trend on the weekly chart. So in order to get this kicker higher, you're going to need to kind of rely heavily on the on the end weakness trade. So watch that 86, uh, excuse me, 87.55, 87.65 barrier first. Here's what the daily chart looks like, um, even on the near term. Coming into some slope resistance up there at 87. Look for the pullback. I'm largely constructive on this trade, uh, basically above 84.80. So I hope that helps, Pete. Just a quick look. He says, great look there, Mike. Thanks for those levels. Good to know it was a pick for me, for the man, Mike. Hey, cheers, mate. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, so, guys, if you have any other questions or trade setups, go ahead and feel free to throw them on the message board. But, uh, fellas, what are the trades that we're looking at for next week? Just round the table real quick. Uh, what's kind of your, your main play for the start of June trade, or July, rather? Jeez. Well, I'll just, you know, as we're talking about yen crosses, let me take over the screen real quickly, guys. Um. I think Kiwi. Yeah, you're a yen man, Mr. Song. What's going on? Well, I'm, I want to start with Kiwi yen, actually. Um, Kiwi yen looks pretty nice. And again, I, I sort of talk about this uh, golden cross that's materializing right now. And I have to respect it, right? Um, Mike, you and I, we talked about it yesterday. But the positive slopes on these, the crossover that we're getting, uh, suggestive that it is a real deal sort of golden cross. And, you know, it doesn't automatically suggest that we're going to shoot higher from here, but, you know, suggestive sure. that the longer term horizon, uh, over the longer term horizon, we should get a more constructive view on this, even though, you know, we're working our way towards those uh, 2017 highs, towards resistance and, zone. And David, that was a really good eye. I, um, you know, that's a really good uh, catch there. If you look previously, and guys, you know, don't ever take our word just for anything point blank, you know, you, Look at previous price action. Mm -hmm. It's real small subtleties like that that people don't really notice, that you mm -hmm. want to see positive slope in both of those uh, moving averages as they cross. Mm -hmm. Truth be told, golden crosses tend to be pretty laggy indicators. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, uh, the implications for the broader trend here certainly do lend the bias higher. I agree with you. Uh, I would be, again, like David said, I'd be cautious about chasing it higher from here, but yeah. certainly uh, the implications on that cross, it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I was mentioning during the webinar that the last time I would say we really got that sort of signal was back here in 20, 2015 when we got the death cross, right, the, the opposite, where, mm -hmm. again, more of a negative slope here with the 200, same sort with 50. And again, immediately we didn't, right, fall lower. We actually stalled a little bit as we got the signal, got the correction. But, you know, once it started going, right, got that meaningful move to the downside. So again, just a nice, I think, longer term indicator that we can pay attention to. So, you know, suggestive to me, and this is how I'll go about, you know, third quarter, if you will, J July trade is, you know, themes that I'm watching, dollar weakness could be also be accompanied by some yet weakness as, you know, even on my end, Mike, I, I'll bring up the DAX too. You know, I, I think we can't fight the equities rally because, you know, Maybe By the way, David, just to cut you off real quick, sorry, yeah. uh, that Kiwi Yen chart, if mm -hmm. you notice, that was the first break above RSI that you've seen in 60 for the year as oh, yes. well. Yes, yes, yes. So there is further evidence in the momentum profile just as much that there is a change in behavior. You can yep. see the pullback finding support mm -hmm. at 40 there. These are all things that are, uh, or right on that 30 level, these are all things that, again, you know, lend the profile more weighted heavily to the upside. Sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt. No, no, thanks for that, Mike, and always... Very observant with the technicals there, so appreciate that. And you know, that's where I, I just want to mention, right? Like, 
on the fundamental side, what could be the catalyst? Yeah, taper tantrum in Europe, but again, just because they stopped the QE doesn't mean that they're going to unload it, right? So I would be cautious about this mentality, right? Yeah, taper tantrum could be exciting trade, it could, it could drive some volatility, but uh, remember, just because they're slowing it down doesn't mean that they're going to unload these things right, right off the bat. So cautious with the ECB, we'll see how the story will pan out, and you know, I think the thing we got to watch right now is, is the BOJ going to be the only game left in town now as they continue to, you know, peg that 10-year yield close to zero, continue with their asset purchase program, but, you know, that's where, you know, one thing I was doing before was just, you know, let's bring up Euro Yen, right? Like, let's bring up some of these Yen crosses where I think that's the big theme that I'm also watching is Yen weakness, will that continue with not only, again, fundamental side, the macro side, right, driven by BOJ easing, but, you know, will the pickup in risk appetite continue? You know, are we just seeing these pullbacks and you know for the bigger thing I think you know the great rotation is you know when the Fed starts unloading the balance sheet right seeing talks about it but we're not there yet right and I know it's very you know um, easy to sort of plan these things out oh well if the Fed starts doing this by this time you know this and that this might evolve but until we get there right those are all speculation and this is where I think we need to be careful because you know and I'll just name it to Mr. Uh, Bullard who came out this week struck a very interesting tone and um, I think his role at the central bank in terms of how markets interpret his language has changed, right? He was known as a hawk, right? During the, even before we got into the normalization process, he, he was arguing how we should have raised rates. And now he's saying the inflation data is not there, right? Even though the Fed forecast 2% inflation, well, wage growth is still weak, this and that, right? So, you know, I, I think there is the risk that, yes, maybe markets have gotten disappointed with the pace of normalization out of the Fed, especially as they're not pricing in that third rate hike for this year. So, you know, will that keep market sentiment afloat, risk appetite afloat? So, you know, will that all turn out to be, again, maybe some yen weakness down the road? And I like the story of watching the euro strength because, you know, we talked about, you guys talked about euro Aussie. Uh, I think euro Kiwi could be a nice play too. I think it's going to play a bit of a catch up here. We'll see how things are going to materialize. But, you know, even this is the last thing I just want to leave off with is euro pound, right? We're stuck in this range here. Uh, but again, I think we have some more room to the top side, and I don't know if I want to call this a golden cross, as we were talking about. Again, just because it's been sort of, all these moving averages have been very flat, but I guess you can argue there's one there. Uh, but the more meaningful thing on mind is I think the surprise, right, that we're getting from the ECB, and I think markets were caught off guard. Will that spur further change in market behavior? And again, with the extreme that we're seeing in your positioning, where again, the overcrowdedness on the short side is this also noting that the pain, really, the risk is all tilted to the top side for the euro, right? Um, so I'll leave it off by there. The way, yeah. David, by the way, for euro pound, just to throw my two cents in, yeah. um, their 88 into 88.50 is stacked, mm -hmm. okay? You have mm -hmm. the 618 retracement from the high. Yep. You have the 2013 swing highs. Uh, you have the January high. There's a lot it's of them, yeah. There's a lot lined up well, there, yeah. So I would even argue, that's... right, that soft support zone that we had, it's just been a big hurdle, but even with this one, I've seen so many calls for head and shoulders, but we've negated it time, uh, time over, right? Uh, yeah, exactly, that's stretch, exactly. I that's but I feel as though markets are still looking for that, right, that they don't want to give up on that trade, and that's where, where's the pain? Top side, right? And this is where Euro looks pretty good, you know, in my opinion, really across the board, and I think that could be a theme that we need to watch throughout the third quarter. But Chris, what are you looking at? Uh, I'm keeping an eye on what's going on with yen and gold. I'm also keeping an eye on what's going on with euro pound. Um, euro pound recently ran back up into the January swing highs there, and we've kind of started to stall out here. We have two attempts recently to break through that January mm -hmm. high, and it's kind of started to fail. Likewise, if you take a look at some of those moving averages, we've clearly started to uh, uh, probe below that around the 20 uh, daily or the 21 EMA. Um, on the chart, and so I'm curious to see if this means we have a larger pullback in scope coming up. Uh, we could be looking at range-bound conditions for some time here. Ultimately, though, I'm I'm thinking that we break to the top side after a little bit of a resolve. I'm not bought in on this idea that the BOE is going to hike rates. And actually, if you take a look at options pricing, neither is the market right now. Uh, market's pricing in that if the BOE does anything, it's more likely going to be in November. Mm. Then August, of course, those are the months in which mm -hmm. the BOE has new QIRs, the quarterly inflation reports. The super Thursdays, right? Exactly. And the BOE isn't one of the central banks that's to move without a new QIR. So um, I personally don't think they're going to hike in August because I think that inflation, just given the way the data is looking at trend, is probably going to top out a little bit in the UK by 
you know, for the June and July months. And then once we get the calendar turning over into, mm -hmm. um, you know, moving forward, then you have the impact of energy mm -hmm. and then, uh, which has been lower during this time last year, mm -hmm. uh, up until recently. And then, you know, you also have the political situation where Brexit looks like it's going down the hard path already, even though it's very preliminary. And you have the very tenuous relationship between the Tories and the DUP. I don't know how long that's going to last. Mm -hmm. I ultimately think we go towards another round of elections. And it's not that the political outcomes matter. It's just simply that Time right now is a finite resource. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if it's for you know Trump and his negotiations with healthcare, if it's with uh, uh, you know Theresa May and negotiating for Brexit, there's a clock on some of these things. And so yeah, the more time spent, negotiation, it's two years, right? They have two years to complete the negotiations. So yeah, and and the more time spent dealing with elections means mm -hmm. less time spent negotiating, which means Very the true. odds of a sudden Brexit slowly start to creep up over time. So, you know, another round of elections would be really bad for the UK, and I think that'd be bad for the pound as well. So I, I think point. ultimately, you know, so, I, I know everyone says head and shoulders here, but I, I don't see the head and shoulders me neither. still. Me neither. So actually, interestingly enough, um, I, you know, I completely agree. First of all, I completely agree with you, Chris, on where on the, on the broader picture for Euro pound. Guys, this is the yearly open. We're just in a range. You know, as long as, as we're in this, we can't get overly constructive, we can't get or, overly bearish, but we are at the top end of a range. Here's your yearly open, high we're testing, low has been tested a few times, even on a gap break, we went right back higher. The one interesting thing I just wanted to highlight is this slope as sort of an identifier of when we might want to play the turnover. I don't think you really want to get, like I said, overly bearish on this just yet. If you take a look at just the high-low high from December, or the low high, low, excuse me, from December, it's almost the same exact slope. And that puts the 50 line, which has offered some really nice pivots, basically at the monthly open here. So you have support in your 87, your key resistance, like I said, you're basically the 89 handles, the region you need to breach uh, to validate the move. Until we clear this, yeah, we're at the top end of a, of a very simple range. So I think the levels on Euro pound are pretty clear too. Another one we'll be watching very closely. Um, but it's interesting to get your take on the pound. I think pound is just is going to be an interesting story in general. Chris, I kind of feel like this whole Brexit story is still being overplayed, right? I mean, people have been screaming about Brexit for how long? And the pound, yeah, we had a big setback since the start of the month, but we basically took back all the monthly losses and we're closing higher. Um, where's the disconnect here? Well, I mean, I think the situation for the pound is pretty clear. They're, they keep talking about getting a good trade deal, they don't, you know, not, not being said is the fact that they have the best trade deal that they can get right now, which is access to the world's largest goods and services market <laughs> at favorable <laughs> terms. Um, so I don't know how they expect to get a better deal by leaving that. That's just me. Uh, so the, the impact on the pound has been real. Of course, their wage growth in the UK is now negative in real terms. So, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter that you got a 3% raise last year, Johnny, because prices went up 4%. Exactly. Um, right. That type, so that type of situation. UE. So, you know, the, the outcomes for the UK aren't good, and a lot of big corporations are re-domiciling over to Dublin, over to Frankfurt, over to Paris, particularly in the financial sector, which is the lifeblood of the London economy. Uh, that's obviously going to have an impact. Um, you know, just because things haven't materialized as quickly as some of the naysayers said they would doesn't mean that there still aren't storms on the horizon. I also think that if you look at Theresa May and her team's decision-making capabilities, you know, around the election, look how poorly thought out that ten that turned out to be. Yeah, that um, backfired. Yeah, that pretty kind of, yeah, backfired really. So, so do we? So do we trust her judgment and what kind of judgment calls she'll make during the Brexit negotiation process? Um, you know, she she seems to think that there's like a quid pro quo here where, uh, you know, the UK will give something up so the EU will give something else up in return. That's not how it's going to be at all. The, there's there's 27 other countries in the EU. Why do they need to, you know, make significant sacrifices for just one country? That seems kind of outrageous um, and, and rather arrogant of, of the of the UK to think so. And, and so and, I think that, mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead, of course. Go ahead. I just think the process is going to be a lot rougher than how people feel and you know there's not like any credible alternative in the UK either because Jeremy Corbyn you know he got more of the election share than people thought he would but that still doesn't make him a competent man from the economics point of view which I don't think he is and you know there's just so much uncertainty and and, and I think Brexit proves it the the snap election proves it that there's just so much uncertainty for Sterling that I just cannot you know be on that boat of being you know 
bullish sterling and that the BOE, you know, they've noted themselves that they're, they can move in either direction, right? So does this encourage me that the Bank of England is feeling that much better now, right? After maybe one or two months of data since the, you know, uh, since we got their last um, interest rate report, uh, inflation report. And, you know, that's where for now, I think we need some more clarity from the BOE. And this is where I'll stick to what I know, which is I think the euro strength, uh, yen weakness, dollar weakness potentially. Um, but, you know, with that, guys, we'll bring things to a close. And just one last comment here from Pete. Um, U.S. equities opening in the green. Should be interesting to see how they finish. I'm uh, going to probably uh, probably thin markets next week with Independence Day on tap. Certainly, guys, and again, that's why I want to show you where we are, where we were, right? And in terms of the skew that we're seeing, right, with some of these major currencies and the position that we're seeing in the retail space. So, you know, just want to be mindful of that, guys. And we are probably going to see thin market conditions. But Pete, just saying, good insight from all of you. Thanks for your time, and my pleasure, Pete. And you know, as we bring things to a close here, guys, just be mindful of again some of the things that are panning out. We'll see if these themes will continue to gather pace really over the coming days, coming weeks. But any last thoughts, guys, from uh, Mike or Chris? Yeah, just watch out, guys, heading into these closes. I always warn everyone, from an intraday standpoint or a short-term trading standpoint, not really our best conditions and environments to be really taking aggressive intraday stance. So a good time to clean up your charts, kind of get a gauge of what we want to be looking at next week. Um, again, highlighting the docket as the RBA. Um, I'll be looking at dollar CAD. I'll be still holding as a disclaimer, a little piece of Kiwi here off the highs. And um, best of luck trading. Have a great weekend, guys. You too, fellas.